so much for the invitation to come here today to this Wilder Future Conference. And thanks to everyone at Hearts and Middlesex Wildlife Trust for the amazing work that you're doing. Uh, you are, as you said, just one of 46 wildlife trusts. And I thought, first of all today, I'd, I'd kick off by telling you a little bit more about the wildlife trusts. Uh, Leslie said, I started in this job in April 2020. Actually, what you didn't say is it was April the 1st, 2020. <laughs> which should have been a bit of a clue that it was going to be interesting first couple of years in the role. And actually, you know, as you said, for a long time, my colleagues were avatars rather than appearing in three dimensions. So it's kind of been an interesting uh, time. But in those first two, three months uh, in, in uh, 2020, as I came into this job as Chief Executive of Wildlife Trust, I did that thing that you all, all, everyone does in your first few months in a job is really learn a bit more about the organisation. And of course I thought I knew the Wildlife Trust well. I'd been a member uh, from when I was a kid and uh, obviously I'd worked alongside the Wildlife Trust a lot in the past. But it's sometimes it's only when you really get into an organisation you just realise how significant uh, it might be or where its strengths are or its weaknesses or whatever. And the thing that really blew my mind is just the scale and reach of the Wildlife Trust. And I want to share the, these things with you. So you probably know that one of the things we're kind of famous for are our nature reserves. You'll, you'll know that we are this amazing structure of locally run, autonomous, independent wildlife trusts like Hearts and Middlesex Wildlife Trust. But actually that's one of 46 wildlife trusts right across the UK and in Alderney and Isle of Man as well a very powerful federation together. But because it's sort of locally run wildlife trusts, often you kind of get the sense that together we might be quite small doing this and that. But in actual fact, put in perspective, across our 46 trusts, we now have more nature reserves than McDonald's has got restaurants in the UK. In fact, we've got a thousand more nature reserves than McDonald's has got restaurants. And in fact, we estimate that 60% of the British population live within three miles walk or cycle ride of one of our reserves. And that was incredibly important in, those first, in that first lockdown in particular, when people perhaps more than at any other moment of their life suddenly realized how important nature was for their physical and mental well-being, but actually, crucially, how important local nature was for them. We had Wildlife Trust supporters who suddenly discovered Wildlife Trust reserves on their doorstep that they didn't know about as people really explored their local environment and, in particular, had that daily dose of nature that they so desperately needed during lockdown. And I think we saw an awakening, a real awakening, across the British public, actually to an extent around the world, about just how important nature is for our well-being during that period. I should say, also, across the piece, we now have 3,000 staff, something like 3,000 staff, 60,000 volunteers, 650 trustees. Our combined turnover last year was almost 200 million. To put it together, we're the sixth largest landowner in the UK. I said, I told Leslie it was going to be a new one today. We've just worked that one out, which is quite fun. Sixth largest landowner in the UK, and we're acquiring new land uh, for nature all the time as well. And the other thing that I find mind blowing is uh, the number of school children that come through our education programs. So in 2019, you can imagine it's been a bit different the last couple of years, over half a million school children came to our education programs, meaning that Wildlife Trust has one of the greatest, biggest education programs of any British charity. So that's all something we get very excited about, about that work. But we're also very concerned about what's happening with respect to both climate change and the nature crisis. The climate and ecological emergency, that phrase we've heard so much in recent years from both school children and scientists and politicians and world leaders alike. And when I came into the role, one of the things that I was being told very loudly, really, from within the Wildlife Trust and from Chief Execs was that we wanted to try and make sure that we were as relevant as possible in the future to tackling the climate ecological crisis. And so we took that period of lockdown, and particularly those first sort of 18 months, to work on Zoom, all the chief execs and chairs of all those individual trusts, coming together to devise a strategy for the Wildlife Trust as a whole that looked at what our combined impact can be. So each Wildlife Trust might have its own strategy. We in the central team will have a strategy. But actually, what does it all add up to? Can we be clear about the impact we want to have and the way we want things to be different by 2030? And I want to share with you now just our 
uh, the strategy that we have adopted recently and what we're planning to do with that My to the Wildlife Trust working at a local, all up to regional and national and internationally over the next few years. We have three big goals in it. And the first, very simply, is we want to see nature in recovery by 2030. I don't know about you, but I, for one, I'm fed up of seeing all those graphs going in the wrong direction. We've all seen them, all the declines in the abundance of our wildlife species, the loss of our diversity of wildlife species, the loss of habitat and so on. Enough. I'm, our job is not just about slowing that decline. It's about turning it around. Our vision is that actually we have more nature in eight years' time, uh, not just a little bit less. And so that's what we're absolutely focused on doing. And as Leslie was saying, there's three principal ways we want to do that. We want to make more space for nature. That's absolutely essential. And we've got this target of getting 30%, a third of our land and sea, in recovery for nature by 2030. That's a target that the UK government has theoretically already signed up to. We're not sure they fully understood what they were doing at the time, but that's another matter. <laughs> So we're going to make sure now that it absolutely gets delivered that way and work in partnership with so many other organisations uh, to do that as well. But obviously it's got to be not just protected, they've got to be managed, it's got to be in good condition, nature's got to be recovering on that land, and it's got to be connecting up, joining the dots between our nature reserves and other organisations' nature reserves and designated sites at the same time to create that nature recovery network across 30% of our land and sea to get nature flourishing again. But we also don't just want to make space for nature, we want to restore the abundance of nature. And I think this is something where perhaps in the conservation sector we've not talked enough about abundance over the last hundred or so years. Perhaps because our history was one of being natural historians and we were very interested in the diversity and classification of species and so on. Actually, we talked a lot about diversity, which was important, of course that's important. But actually, if you think about it, you know, even if we were able to protect and stop certain species of bees going extinct, if actually you don't have those bees in the abundance that they should be in, they're not going to perform the ecosystem function that we need them to do. And so actually having species in proper abundance is essential for making sure nature is flourishing. And the third point is very simply get nature working again. Novel concepts, particularly in this part of the world, that our wetlands should be wet. What a novel idea. <laughs> rather than rivers running dry. And in fact, reintroducing species that are missing, particularly things like beavers that are very good at making sure our wetlands stay wet, species that are missing to make sure nature is working and we see those natural processes operating as they should. So that first goal is all about getting nature in recovery. The second goal, and essential to delivering that first, is that people are taking action on the climate and nature agenda. Because none of that's going to happen just through bits of clever policy and, and clever thinking, much as that will be very important as well, we absolutely need to have this groundswell of people pushing for this to happen. And so we've got a target of getting one in four of the British population taking action on climate and nature by 2030. You know, there's no solutions to environmental problems that can be done to people. The only ones that last and endure are those that are done by people, and actually by communities of people, and more to the point, by diverse and inclusive communities of people working together to build a movement to drive the big, bold change that we need. And so at the Wildlife Trust, we're going to be really focused over the years ahead on community empowerment, community organising, giving communities the tools and support they need to drive the change. And it's not so much about us telling communities what to do, it's empowering them to find the solutions to drive the change at the local level and in a way that adds up to national impact as part of the international movement to try and reverse the climate and nature crisis as well. And in that, we think there's a particularly important role, of course, for young people. We want to build a youth movement across the wildlife trusts. You know, the wildlife trust might have quite a lot of people in it now that are a certain age, my age, and perhaps a little bit above as well, but we never forget the fact that we were started by people in their 20s and 30s, albeit because it was 110 years ago. We look at the black and white pictures now and they were dressed up rather smartly and you kind of assume they were quite old. But no, it was started by young people in their 20s, in their 30s. And we want to absolutely make sure that young people have a position of power within the Wildlife Trust movement as well as we move forward 
in the years ahead. Our third big goal is to actually make sure that all this means that nature is playing a full and valued role in helping solve the big problems we face in society. I mean, first of those is, of course, climate change. And in my, in my career in this sector, I've long been frustrated about how sometimes we talk about the ecological crisis and the climate crisis as if they're kind of completely separate things. And people talk about the solutions for one over here and the solutions is here as if they're completely separate. But they're inextricably linked. We have no hope of solving the climate crisis unless we can put nature into recovery. We have no hope, hope in putting nature in recovery unless we can address the climate crisis. And if you need any clearer proof than that, you just have to think about this. What's caused climate change is, of course, the burning of fossil fuels. And what are fossil fuels? Well, they're dead biodiversity. So we've got to stop burning fossil fuels, but actually, if we can restore the abundance of nature as well, that will help draw down carbon and lock it away in the biosphere where it belongs as well. So that's an incredibly important thing to do. And also, nature can play an important role in actually helping us adapt to the climate change that's already locked in. If we can restore our wetlands and restore our river corridors, if we can restore our peat bogs, which I know you don't have here, but I'm going to mention them anyway. If we can restore all those wetlands, uh, restore the carbon in our soils, that means less water running off in a rush into our rivers during extreme weather events as well and reducing the risk of flooding. Just one example of how we can do that. Or if you have trees in urban areas, that can help cooling in our urban areas on hot summer days as well. So nature can also help us address the extremes of climate change and adapt to that. But not just climate change. I mentioned before also how critical nature is for our physical and mental well-being. Physical in that it helps reduce air pollution and also just improves the quality of life, but also our mental well-being, how important that is as well. And I think over the years, the UK, our society, in fact, the whole Western world has downplayed how important, how almost dismissed what we know to be true, which is how critically important nature is for our well-being. So we want to make sure that it's playing that role as well in helping address things in society. Did you know in Canada, doctors can prescribe people free membership of national parks to help them get better? Makes you think about perhaps what we could be doing here in the UK as well, and actually taking pressure off our NHS in the process. So how nature can help us address the climate crisis, pollution crisis, uh, also, of course, the health crisis, and many more besides as well. Nature can help us if we let it, if nature is desperate almost to help us solve these problems, but we've got to allow it to do that, and we've got to help nature to do that as well. And there's a couple of other final things I wanted to say on this, and I think particularly given where we are today at Rothamsted, it's important to make another little point about as well, because over the last couple of months in particular, there's been a bit of a debate in the media about to what extent actually this goal this agenda of trying to put nature in recovery is at tension with a food security debate. And my own view is that couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. You know, we've had 50 years of uh, farmers being subsidised in this country to drive intensive agriculture that has resulted in our soils often being eroded and declining in soil fertility and actually resulting in a situation where t in 2022... According to some of those experts themselves, they're saying we're dependent on inputs, high inputs, not least fossil fuels from places like Russia. So the idea that we need more of the same to solve this, I think, is entirely wrong. If ever there was a moment for us to be moving to regenerative agriculture, now is it, where we can restore nature and deliver food hand in hand. You know, there's no such thing as food security if nature continues to be in decline. We've got to restore nature to deliver us good food for the future and all of those other benefits as well. And in fact, we've got to restore nature as well to make sure we have a prosperous economy in the future because actually the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of nature, not the other way around. You know, if the economy disappeared, nature would be fine. If nature disappeared, the economy would be in a very bad state indeed. So I'd go as far as this. This is about us making sure that our human civilization can move into its next step of human progress. Our next step of human progress surely is learning to live fairly within environmental limits, in harmony with nature, 
and with nature flourishing around us. And if it's not that, I can't work out what it is. And the science doesn't tell us what it is either. So just think about this when we're talking about a wilder future this afternoon and the fantastic work that Hearts and Middlesex Wildlife Trust do. Yes, it's important for nature in Hearts and Middlesex, but it's also part of a global movement to learn to live fairly within environmental limits and actually make sure that we have a good, prosperous future for humans and nature. Thank you very much. Thank you.